I'd like to introduce you to the filmmaker, Charlie Frisch, who is sitting here, and who has who is a student at uh, the School of Environment, I guess it's called now. It used to be called the Forestry School. And in any case, and she has made a number of videos or films before this. So she's a filmmaker and uh, there you have it. So questions to the speaker. Yeah, I am. Um, so I'm uh, Lodewijk, uh, Lodewijk van Deke, Ludo in English. I'm a visiting researcher at the law school and I am a postdoc, and my PhD was about the regulation of uh, seed systems in Sub-Saharan Africa, specifically uh, Francophone Africa, Senegal, and Burkina Faso. And I'm from Belgium, so I, I know the European system a little bit. Um, I, uh, I think you're doing a very good job of explaining and making palpable, uh, both for me, but also for people who haven't really worked on this, perhaps. Um, making palpable why it's uh, so important to not only have um, conservation in a seed bank, but also in situ, as they say, yeah. in fields and, and to uh, have this as living knowledge. Um, there's plenty of comments going through my mind. One of it is, uh, I don't know how this comes across, but at some point you mentioned the uh, International Union for uh, the Protection of New Varieties of Plants, the UPOF. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually legally not correct. Oh, that one shouldn't have been there. So I don't know if there's any editing you can you can do more because it's it's an intellectual property union. It doesn't have anything to do with market access and what plant varieties are allowed to be cultivated in the field. Okay. Um, so far, the, the, the nasty comment. Uh, what I wanted to know is, um, but you've already told a little bit, like how how did you, why did you want to make this movie, and then how like was this. How did you film this? How did you produce this? Was it just you? Was it, was it with a handheld camera? And, and especially what motivated you? What fascinated you to make this? Yeah, um, thank you for your question. Um, it's cool that you've also researched this and everything. And I would love to talk to you more about that. That sounds amazing. Um, yeah, I've been making films since I was um, really young. I had my parents take home videos of me since I was three. And then when I was in high school, my dad gave me all the films that they had taken over my entire childhood and asked me to organize it. And once I went through all those films, then um, he was like, okay, now you can edit. And they both do graphic signing on the side. And so they had Adobe Premiere Pro. So I learned video editing at a very young age and um, started really just getting passionate about the power of film and how it can just take you to a different place. Um, and then in college, I was a part of a student-led documentary team and we focused on social justice issues and made a documentary every year. Um, and the documentary, my sophomore year, we focused on um, refugees and receiving communities as well um, in the German context and then also in Minnesota. Um, and so that is when I just really became curious about this meaning of home and how we can create more inclusive spaces that are embracing of biodiversity, but also cultural diversity, which is important for climate change and just on multiple different levels. So just got more curious about that. And then, um, yeah, I was retaining my Danish dual citizenship um, two years ago before coming to Yale School of Environment. And um, I met this woman who is out in the rural Denmark, and she had this lovely garden of seeds that had previously been illegal in Denmark up until 2015. And she told me this wonderful story about seed saving in Denmark. And that's what let me hear. And yeah, I did um, all the filming and editing on my own. And I just used a Sony um, A7 and had some lovely support from the Yale program on refugees and also from other funders to help me get there and do it. It's really impressive. It's, it's really. It's really cool. Thank you. Very nice documentary. Thanks. Um. Uh, uh, I have a technical question about the seed 
the seed bank, which yeah. I know a little bit about. I'm a backyard gardener and a seed saver. I don't know how much time you spent there. So I understand the basic premise of what that's meant to do. But you know, like I have seeds, it's funny. I was just planting some lettuce seeds, spring started that are maybe 10 years old and none of them were viable anymore. So how does the seed bank, I know it's very cold, that's part of the premise of why it's there, but how do they deal with the fact that like seeds do need to be grown it's my understanding and my experience, or they are not viable. So are they not only a repository, but that they constantly have to grow them to reseed the bank, which seems daunting on the scale of the billions of seeds there. Yeah, yeah, there are quite a few seeds there. And the question of germination is really important. Um, and through like the countries that deposit seeds there. I know every couple of years they'll have new deposits that are made, um, but the gene bank um, in Svalbard does not do any of the germination themselves. Um, so people would have to like send in new varieties to replace the older ones. Um, but the Nordic Genetic Resource Center does do um, germination tests and that is, yeah. So like Lisa Lukasevitsen, who is at the end of the film, mm -hmm. um, they do germination testing um, with like all the Nordic countries and they kind of control that, make sure that all the germination rates are good, but for the rest of the countries, they are not, yeah, they don't help with that. Yeah. Great yeah. film, great, great, great story. Thank you. Can I ask you something about the seed bank yes. in Svalbard? Yes. So they lend out seeds, and then people have to reproduce them and send back new ones, right? So the Svalbard Gene Bank is almost like, just like a bank. So every country that sends in their seeds, they can keep them there. Mm -hmm. um, but the Nordic Genetic Resource Center, which is based in Sweden, they can send people some seeds out and then they can grow them. Okay, yeah. so the, the Norwegian ones are sitting there. Yes. And not doing anything. Yes. And like Rob says, so, well, yeah, don't they run out of steam eventually? Yeah, eventually, yeah. Or is the idea that they that you just want the genetic code in there and it's not necessarily you're saving the seed is a viable thing? Well, I mean, sometimes seeds are viable forever because yeah. I know that in archaeology, we sometimes find viable seeds that are thousands of years. Yeah. They're mainly weeds, but still. Yeah, as far yeah. as I know, Svalbard, it's a backup of the backup. Yeah. So we have in situ cultivation, we have gene banks for like, not is this is a CGIAR seed bank, Svalbard. Um, it's part of the CGIAR. It's a right? part of um, the Nordic Genetic Resource Center okay. and Crop Trust. There's like two entities. There's an international organization for um, breeding varieties, but also conservation. And uh, for instance, that international organization has a, a gene bank for banana seeds. And that one is in Leuven, Belgium. And bananas too are, um, yeah, you cannot save banana seeds forever. So you have to renew your gene bank yeah. all the time. And this one is all those different seed banks. You have uh, some for wheat, some for mm -hmm. rice, some for maize. Uh, and I guess they do lots of the conservation, also planting it out. And every five years you have to renew it. And then they, around the globe, the seed banks will send it to Svalbard so far away from everywhere in the ice as a backup of the backup. Mm -hmm. So it's not, they don't have, they mainly have the seeds that stay well for a, a longer a long time. time. And they do, don't do the outgrowing because the other seed banks that mostly okay. do the outgrowing. That's yeah, why well, they have it. seed banks everywhere, don't they? Mm -hmm. I mean, and I know that when a lab, a leper got bombed 10 years ago, mm -hmm. they lost their seed bank. Yeah. Yeah. But then they borrowed from I don't know where. They borrowed from Svalbard. Yeah, yeah. Okay. they had that's like, the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the backup. Back right. the backup. Exactly, yeah. right. and that was the first and only time that a withdrawal has been made from yeah. Svalbard. Oh. But while I was there, um, there was some people from the new gene bank um, because yeah, the first one was destroyed, but then they made a new one in Lebanon, and they had a representative um, that came to, from that gene bank to come deliver 12 new varieties to the Svalbard Global Seed Vaults. Um, and he is a endurance athlete and he was paralyzed from the waist down. And mm -hmm. so he used this exoskeleton to walk up the mountain and it was like a 
hike for climate hope and it took 10 hours to walk all the way up the mountain and we all did it together and then he got to deliver the new um, seat so it just shows that yeah. they have a, a good relationship but they're part of CCAR actually yeah so they actually regrew the seats in in theory devastated as it is because I don't know I, I read somewhere who knows where that they had to regrow them in Lebanon or in even in Morocco because it was impossible. I mean, you know, there are landmines everywhere in Syria. It's very hard to do agriculture, really. Yeah, they had taken them to Lebanon. Yeah, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a question. So I understand that you want to increase diversity into the seeds that you have. But isn't there as well like a risk in bringing some um, plants that are non-indigenous that can sort of like take over the, the yeah. local ones? Yeah, I definitely think that that is an important risk. And one of the reasons that I think some more harsh seed legislation came out in addition to other reasons as well. Um, but I think that um, with like careful research and testing and making sure that things won't be like super invasive and that they'll be, yeah, good hosts to the land as well. I think that um, it's really important and something that we're gonna have to look more into with climate change as we have um, seed varieties, a lot of monoculture is less adaptive to climate change. So finding things that are more adaptive and responsive is gonna be more of a, a need. Yeah, it's definitely important to make sure that it's not super invasive. The other thing is that all this monoculture is, I mean, there are patents on certain seeds for various grains, etc., owned by what? Monsanto, somebody like that. Now, how did they manage to take a patent out on seeds? Yeah. I think <clears throat> and all these laws, you know, I mean, okay, so they don't obey the laws in Scandinavia, good for them. But they do in lots of places and yeah. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> I think um, like how harsh seed legislation is now and like intellectual <coughs> property rights of seeds is really important to look at. I don't, I'm not super expert on um, intellectual property <coughs> rights specifically. <coughs> Just having owning of intellectual property right over a species or over a living entity is kind of a bizarre concept in general. And especially with companies like Monsanto, which is now Bayer, um, and just kind of capitalizing and profiting off of, um, yeah, nature's never, never, has never turned out so well in the past. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna try and weigh in a little bit here. Um, so the, these laws, the, the original, I think the core mission of these laws uh, that determine what kind of seeds farmers can sow, can sow is uh, national food security. That's, that's the bottom line. You don't want farmers to sow whatever, which would uh, import um, plant diseases or which would reduce yields, um, which would then um, endanger food security in Denmark, context of the entire European Union, or for instance, in the US. There's two ways of going about it in the US, the American model, um, is um, it's all it's it's towards law. It's, it's it's afterwards. If you're a seed company and you sell seeds that turn out not to germinate, then you can be sued in court, and the penalties will be so high that you have a very strong incentive to be very careful about the seeds you disseminate. In Europe, we've somehow um, I think uh, a worse system. Actually, I think it's originally coming from France, although I'm not sure. We're going to do it beforehand if you want to hand out seeds or if you want as a company you want to distribute seeds you need to ask permission for the specific variety you need to register your variety that's the us conditions and those are the same conditions for intellectual property and for market access but here for market access conditions and then your variety is registered a new variety of wheat and then per batch of seeds that you want to sell you also need to go through a, a government procedure where they will check on the batch of seeds now, what's, what's happened here, and I think that, that may be another problem of interpretation with um, in, in the movie that I see, is at some point you say Denmark has the most liberal seed laws. That's, I think, not, not true. That could be the pendulum uh, coming back because 
Uh, Denmark and the Netherlands are easily the two countries in Europe, I think, with the most intensive agriculture. The Netherlands is the yeah. number one is the number one exporter. Denmark has all its dairy, um, and they have government and 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 agro industry is so much involved that you have a huge uh, degree of, of implementation of these laws. If you go to Greece or to Italy. You have more land races, agriculture is more small scale. It's also like the Mediterranean cuisine, all these things. Yeah. And what has happened is 10 years ago in Europe, um, NGOs have actually scored something of, an, of, an, uh, of a victory and have been able to put on the agenda of the European Parliament that all those seed laws that say beforehand what you can cultivate are too strict and that there has to be a conservation corrective. Yeah. Eventually, the entire conservation directive was on the agenda, but it's NGOs again that torpedoed it because it wasn't radical enough. It didn't allow for enough conservation. I guess some kind of compromise, but I, I don't know the details, could have been that a country like Denmark said, hey, we've gone a lot further than many of these other countries. Let's now uh, try and allow some more conversation in our own country, for instance, by not applying European laws as strictly. And, and so I think if you say Denmark has the most liberal uh, laws for conservation, and for seed exchange, I interpret that as Denmark having gone back from precipice of being the most agro-industrial country together with the Netherlands. Um, so sorry for, for taking yeah, so no, no, But I mean, this, this farmer who was farming a field for rye, and he was saying, okay, so we, do, we use different seeds and it's different kinds of rye and it makes different kinds of flour. But I guess he doesn't distribute the seeds. So in that sense, you know, Mm -hmm. is within the EU or whatever rules there are about. You can't sell the seeds, but there's nothing to prevent you from actually planting them again. Sure, small scale in your own and I, stuff, mostly it's that. It's I'll just... also say for the comment on the most liberal seed legislation, that wasn't something that I personally said. It was something that somebody from the Danish seed saving, um, yeah, Danish seed savers said as well. Um, and I think that these regulations on seed diversity do come from national security, but something that I've witnessed in my own research and looking at this from more of an environmental anthropological lens is that a lot of the seed legislation popped up around the same time that there was a lot of conversation around eugenics and that there was this idea of genetic purity that has emerged. And if you look at old seed catalogs, it's supposed to be something that they will advertise for with using the same language that a lot of people within the Nazi regime used as well. And so I think that while there is like a biological lens looking at how we regulate seeds, there is also a social lens that got mixed up within this as well, which has been destructive for the genetic diversity of our food systems. Yeah. But so, yeah, I don't think they're so liberal in Denmark. They're just going to you know, say, well, there's this rule and we don't care. This is a normal Danish attitude, mm -hmm. you know, so. <laughs> yeah, true, true. And they're, they're not the most faithful um, clients no. of European participation. They say, uh, sometimes say Brussels, there's other countries that are, are more loyal to Brussels than Denmark, so. Right, that's the same. But no, but I mean, <coughs> if Monsanto owns the, uh, patent on all these uh, agricultural seeds. Well, good for them. But I mean, they also own the patent on all the horrible uh, artificial, you know, fertilizers, et cetera, et cetera. And Roundup, I think, is made by them also. So it seems like, you know, they have it all sort of sewn up, you know. You have to have our seeds and you have to use our poisons to make these seeds grow. And it becomes, you know, a real monopoly, which I do think would be good if somebody could break it up a little bit. But I don't know how extensive it is and where where it it exists uh, all the time and for everybody. Yeah, I think I feel like in the U.S. context and probably also for the Danish context that most agriculture is 
yeah, using these kinds of seeds. And I think that the more radical versions of having seeds that are heritage varieties is um, still a very small scale. But I think a lot of younger farmers that I had spoken to in Denmark, they were looking at this and saying, this is not a good system. This is not a system that's going to be around forever because it's destroying our climate and it's not going to um, survive through certain disasters or it's, it's not going to be very hospitable anymore. So they have a bit of an interest to disturb it as well. So I thought that that gave me a lot of hope that there is a lot of young farmers that are doing things a little bit differently. Well, I guess also by now, there are a lot of people who are interested in organic farming, mm -hmm. which there certainly was not before. But I don't know. I mean, I don't know in this country how big it is. It's getting bigger all the time, I guess. But it could take many years before, you know, people give up on all these various chemicals that they use. Yeah. So... Can you talk a little bit more about, like, as you mentioned, like the adaptation as well that probably needs to happen, even, uh, even if you like it or not, with the climate change? Yeah, and just adaptation and climate change broadly, or yeah, no, for the seeds, obviously. So I don't know what do you, what path do you see, um, and also, I guess as in other um, issues regarding the, the lower income countries uh, with respect to the uh, developed ones. Yeah. Yeah, I think that this is like a really amazing opportunity for in situ and ex situ seed banks to work together um, in developing these seeds. And this is something that I witnessed when I went to the Nordic Genetic Resource Center in Sweden. They had this very popular oat milk um, company called Oatly, and they were working with them and had a whole field of different oat varieties and were researching what oat varieties are the most drought resistant or the most heat tolerant or yeah what produced the most oat seeds and so that there's some research there which I think is helpful and um, these bigger gene banks I think that they have a lot of more resources so they have um, an obligation to help with companies and help with individuals to understand better adaptation practices um, and I think that this can be a way also for maybe also lower income countries to work with um, genetic resource centers to understand um, how to grow seeds, but also to rely on the local networks as well, because I think a lot of the local networks have knowledge that these ex situ gene banks do not, because yeah, you have a situation where you have Svalbard that doesn't have any of the like cultural knowledge attached to the seed as well. It's not like you have like when you scan the barcode of the seed that's kept up there that a recipe pops up or the history of growth pops up either. It's just a seed. So if, um, yeah, everybody lost their knowledge one day, then there'd be nothing to, to keep that alive either, which is why cultural knowledge is important for adaptation as well. Yeah, well, one of your speakers in here, I forget which one, the Norwegian one maybe, uh, was saying that, yeah, it's important to save all these seeds, but we also have to save the knowledge of where to grow them and how to grow them and where not to do it, et cetera. And uh, yeah, so all these millions of seeds in Svalbard, do they come with instructions? No, no. <laughs> and nobody's doing that? No, no. But um, it says where they came from, right? It yeah, it says, says where they came from, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, Charlie, this 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 could actually be, if you wanted, this could be a live work of you, eh? because I mean, you're saying it yourself. This is not something that you can document in a way of uh, we're gonna have a database, we're gonna put uh, I don't know zeros and ones mm -hmm. in it, or this is something you can only document that for um, posterity via video, actually. Yeah. Um, and via uh, witnesses and uh, recipes and and yeah, perhaps there are people who who. They should people should pay for this and 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 perhaps you're in a position to convince somebody to pay you to yeah, do this maybe. maybe go around go around the countryside and in, 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 i don't know in somewhere where there's lots of heirloom varieties and start from there yeah 
Yeah. I mean, in some way, it's a lot of work, but it's not terribly a uh, challenging concept, right? You just, yeah. it's a lot of groundwork, but you it's like these? you interview people, you get some recipes, you have some, you know, some yeah. basic uh, rubric of, of how many people you would talk to for each one. And it's a lot of groundwork, but I think that it's a great, great idea. And you could somewhat codify for each seed, you want to have this many representatives. Yeah. And for a country, for instance, take example, uh, the ex again, the example of Italy, you don't have to do this for Italy. There's still a lot of heirloom varieties yeah. compared to other rich countries, but the Italian kitchen is so well known around the world yeah. that all these, but if you, I don't know, I'm thinking of a country like Mali, for instance, yeah. just, a, just a random example of an African uh, country. If you would go around there, then there's, there's a lot to save and probably also a lot of culinary knowledge and to share later with other mm -hmm. people and to motivate the global public to be interested in these uh, mm -hmm. land yeah. races, heirloom varieties. Uh, and, and the Mali and Kitchen. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, I feel like that's a really good idea. And I think that there's been a lot of really amazing work with like visual anthropology and visual storytelling within indigenous communities in the US and Canada and documenting traditional practices as people are becoming older and trying to figure out how to pass knowledge down to younger populations. But yeah, even reaching- Well, maybe nobody's asking globally. any questions either. I mean, that's yeah. another problem. Yeah. But then you also have the risk of like, if you do go to, um, yeah, countries like that are maybe lower income or you go to countries that are really genetically rich, like Mali or something, and you publish, um, you have all this like, knowledge that's kept up then you really want to be sure that it doesn't get in the wrong hands as well because okay. there's yes. definitely seed companies that mm -hmm. be interested in mm -hmm. having that kind of knowledge mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah there's there's a there's also a question of cultural appropriation yeah um what very often happens in in the, in the so i work actually in africa i know more about africa than about europe and it's actually seed companies are not interested in this knowledge they're not interested in uh, most seed companies are not interested in most of the crops that are grown by uh, by by uh, traditional crops grown by smallholder farmers in the south. And what many farmers will do is um, they will, for instance, they will have a food crop, which is which can be an international traded crop also, or a crop that you find in many many countries like rice, or like wheat, or even I'm sorry, or whatever. And then they will have. Uh, for instance, a cash crop like, like cocoa, but they will also on, on the side have some of their more traditional uh, veggies or other um, crops. So they have, they have a diverse farming exercise and seed companies are not interested in say the site operation of uh, heirloom varieties. This is something that's really on farmers uh, time, on farmers books, seed companies, they're, they're maximally they're trying to replace this but they there's no market in it it's too small it's too regionally diverse they are interested in the other two the cash crop and the, and the, um and, and the main group crop for, for uh for food and what you see there is very often that those crops are not uh, local to the area very often um they've come through uh, colonialism uh, they, they've been introduced in other areas for instance potato is in uh, it's a new world crop, but you also find it in many different places in Africa. Uh, rice, for instance, in West Africa is, is not indigenous, or at least not the type of rice you find now. But at the same time, what happens is that the farmers who are not growing their traditional crop that they've always been growing with the entire richness of genetic diversity, they are growing old varieties of the, 19, of the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s that still have been introduced by the colonizer. And the problem is then that many seed companies are actually not interested in these markets because they're too small and the farmers are too poor. So instead of growing the newest commercial varieties of rice, farmers, farmers are growing very old commercial varieties of rice uh, that also need fertilizer, that are also genetically uh, of poor quality, uh, but that on top of all that don't yield enough. Um, so in many African countries, in my experience, I would say that there's uh, that seed companies, that, that, that we need more seed companies uh, coming in to focus on certain of those uh, cultures. Uh, but your story is more around the local crops, the veggies, and, and uh, yeah, but for many farmers, their main cultivation is not in that. Yeah. No, no, you have to be rich to, be, to do all this experimenting. I mean, you know, you couldn't do it on a commercial scale if you didn't know what was, what was it going to be and how was it going mm -hmm. to turn out, you could not. True. Yeah. yeah. But then it's like, 
maybe it's okay if things are on a smaller scale in mm-hmm. the future. Like maybe it's not super sustainable to have huge, uh, huge plots of land that are just owned by a couple of people. And yeah, and I, maybe that is a little optimistic because I feel like, especially with uh, Bill Gates' recent decisions to buy up all the oh, farmland. Um, but I think, um, I think it's going to have to be more localized maybe in the future. Yeah. But the thing is that, I mean, there the, the question is how to balance this competing objective, because in any case, you cannot, and they would not do, I mean, some small farmers, they also need to, uh, I mean, sustain themselves. So it's not that they might want to grow a different uh, variety of uh, plant, but at some point, you also need to be able to be like survive off of that. Survive. Yeah, so absolutely. Like, uh, yeah, so. yeah. Well, I mean, this I guess is the industrialization of, of you know, agriculture, and uh, yeah, we have that. But you know, there should be room for experimenting, and I think it's good. Your age is exactly <laughs> the age that you do. It. One of the, the cool I'm things I think with the, the farmer that he's like standing in the middle of the wheat fields that I think right, right. Rye, yeah, rye fields is that um like he has this beautiful farm plot that's got yeah 12 different varieties of all these different things growing together, which is really cool. Um and as you're driving up to the farm, there are all these farms around him that every plant is the same size there's no birds around it's very quiet and then you get up to his farm and there's explosions of birds happening everywhere it's super diverse he's not using like fertilizers on his land and yeah it's very it's very much a different feeling so I think it was cool to see like what it could be like as well yeah thank you more questions no that was lovely great 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 job thank you thank you for uh, being here and showing us your uh, documentary to see your next film yes definitely